All right, welcome everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all back or for the new ones coming to the seminar series uh, to come over here to this side of campus for our distinguished speaker series. So this series is uh, sponsored and have been started by the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering in honor of Professor Cheng Mei, who is faculty in the department who did seminal work in theoretical mechanics and fluid mechanics. And um, Professor Buriba, Lydia, and my it's my great pleasure today to introduce. No, it's my great pleasure today to introduce you with today's speaker, Professor Jacob Israel Akvili. So, Dr. Israel Akvili is professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He received his PhD in experimental physics from the University of Cambridge in the UK. He made seminal and major contribution in understanding intermolecular forces in complex fluids and surface sciences. So, for example develop new methods to measure with high precision repulsion and attraction forces between surfaces and have applied these concepts and tools to a wide range of applications from, for example, the Geico's ability to adhere to walls to uh, measuring basically the breakdown of, uh, of lubrication layers between bones that lead to osteoporosis. Dr. Jacob Israel Akvili had numerous awards uh, and, had been a and is a member of many academies. So for example, he's a member of the National Academy of Science and also the American Academy of Engineering, and to just include a few. And so without any further ado, uh, it is, please join me, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jacob Israel Akvili. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and that the volume is good. So, um, as Lydia said, without further ado, I'm going to delve into my subject, which is to do with all sorts of non-equilibrium interactions in all sorts of material systems. I was, I was asked to talk about everything, um, which uh, uh, is very difficult. Uh, talk about biology, talk about physics, talk about chemistry, talk about materials, uh, arthritis, geckos, I don't know. So I'm going to do my best. And I'll start by uh, talking about an, an experiment that is ongoing. It's one of the oldest ongoing experiments um, that exists. And it's called the pitch drop experiment. And if you take, this is in Australia, if you take pitch and hit it with a hammer, it is a solid, it's brittle, it cracks. And if you're a material scientist, you would measure its fracture strength and all sorts of other things. And um, on the other hand, if you now um, wait for about 10 years, you find that this started in 1927. Uh, every 10 years or so, uh, a drop falls. So this material just has a very high viscosity. And, um, and yet it shows what, uh, you know, is this material a solid or is it a liquid? Well, actually it's a liquid, it's just that you have to wait very long. And, and that is really what I'm gonna be talking about with even more complicated examples. But it shows that you can have creep and creep can be something that after a year you won't see it, but after 10 years you will. And in some cases you need to wait even longer for it to happen. Uh, they introduced air conditioning in the, in the University of Queensland, and that took the time from less than 10 years to more than 10 years. And the next one is due, um, I don't know when. So this is the sort of by way of um, background. And um, I don't want to go into all sorts of different forces that exist between surfaces. Uh, covered in my book, but there's attractive forces that could be uh, uh, Van der Waals, could be uh, electrostatic, there's repulsive forces that can be due to entropic, surfaces with polymers on them, liquid structuring, um, and all sorts, uh, also electrostatic, there's binding, adhesion forces that only occur at short range, there's even oscillatory forces when you have liquid structure with layers confined between surfaces. But the important thing I want to say is that we've got to distinguish, these are the equilibrium thermodynamically equilibrium interactions. But the important thing is to appreciate that in the world we live in, most interactions are not at equilibrium and not even necessarily, any system doesn't even necessarily going to, towards the equilibrium system. 
And this is especially true with biological interactions. Um, if anything biological was uh, at equilibrium, it would, would be dead. And uh, essentially, even if in a steady state, if things are not changing with time, it still doesn't mean it's the thermodynamic equilibrium state. It could just be receiving energy at a, a rate that keeps it uh, uh, the structures of the complex system uh, unchanged. And we need to distinguish between uh, energies and forces. Often people talk about the strength of an interaction without specifying what it is. Energies and forces are very different. We need to talk about uh, transient effect, hysteretic effect, steady state, reversible and history dependent. And you know, when it comes to self-assembly, uh, is it really self-assembly? Is it thermodynamically driven? Or is it engineered or directed assembly? We've done something to the system, like make an alloy, and yet that system on the phase diagram should separate, but will take uh, a, a very, very long time to do that. So we're in a situation. What happened here? Uh, OK. Uh, so. What are the fact, uh, properties that give rise to dynamic interactions? Well, there are many, and I'm going to give examples of each of these in my talk. So, for example, viscosity effects. Well, this is pretty trivial. Everybody knows that uh, when you have viscous forces, then it will depend on rate and, and uh, time. So that's, uh, but that's one example that's uh, often very important. Uh, diffusion and exchange. Water and ions and lipids in biological systems need to diffuse in and out of a cell or in and out of the nucleus or in and out of a tissue. And that can take a long time to reach any sort of equilibrium, osmotic or even non-equilibrium. These are things that can be very slow. It could be fast for the water, but slow for the ions. So it could have different rate effects. Changing morphologies, I'll give uh, examples of changing structures. This happens in biological systems, in the cell. It happens in geological systems. Rocks change their morphology. Or just like the pitch drop experiment, you know, things were changing with time, but it took a few years to see it. In other cases, it happens in milliseconds. In other cases, it can uh, take a, a million years, like uh, diamond changing to uh, graphite. Actually, does anyone know the lifetime of diamond um, at room temperature? before it changes to graphite? Oh, neither do I. Um, <laughs> I've been asking that question to diamond experts, and they always blink and look blank. And I think, so what have you been doing all your life? Anyway, <laughs> I, it's true. Uh, activation energy as well. This is known to give rise to slow effects where activation energies need to be and competitive or sequential interactions, very important in biological systems, where an interaction just doesn't happen between two particles. It's something that uh, uh, one molecule affects another, and then that in turn affects another, one side of the membrane, then goes to the other side, then goes into the, into the cytoplasm, uh, and, uh, or, or diffuses on the membrane, and then it causes an interaction somewhere else. So all of these things are are important in, 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 in real complex systems. Some of the results I'm going to show, many of them are to do with the surface forces apparatus. And I won't go and describe it, but I'll just mention that the two surfaces uh, facing each other, it's a bit similar to, to, in some ways, to an AFM, except that it uses extended surfaces. And there are various methods of changing the distance and controlling it using springs and piezoelectric crystals. One can change distances to within an angstrom and using an optical technique that allows one to look at the surfaces and measure their deformations uh, um, in real time. And um, this has been used for many years now to look at forces between macroscopic uh, surfaces in, in liquids or uh, vapors, adhesion, as well as sliding laterally. This picture shows what happens when, you, when uh, you pass light through the surfaces. And this is white light. And it, the surfaces often are just cross cylinders, locally a sphere, like a sphere on a flat. And then the light goes to a spectrometer. It changes the, uh, separates the different wavelengths. So if you have curved surfaces, uh, you see a series of fringes. I won't describe the details, but uh, these are well-known fringes. Um, that reflect the shapes of the surfaces. And when the surfaces are brought together, the fringes 
move to shorter wavelengths and then when contact occurs you get a flat part and that gives us the shape of the surfaces. The flat part is the contact area and or radius and um, one can measure this to about an angstrom and one can then measure forces by measuring the changing uh, deflection or the stiffness of springs and one can move surfaces laterally and measure friction or lubrication forces. If one was looking down on the surfaces just with an ordinary microscope and let's say there was a little droplet of liquid between them, very, very tiny droplet, one would see discontinuities in the fringes, uh, these fringes, but otherwise one would just see a circle uh, without very much more information, but here one can actually get a, a lot of more information uh, when measuring uh, how the surfaces change their shape as well as the separation, as, as well as measuring the forces. I will also give some results uh, with AFM. The AFM technique is also uh, is well known. The difference being is that one measures the interaction between a tip or a colloidal probe, small radius, but smaller than in the SFA, uh, and the surface, and then scans the surfaces one way or another, and either using light or pizzo, uh, sorry, or piezoresistive um, um, elements uh, measures the normal and lateral components of the forces as one moves the surfaces uh, or scans across a surface. And I'll start by the most uh, common interactions between surfaces uh, in water, and this is known as the DLVO of the Dereag in Landa, Overby and Overbeek, who, who, who came up with this theory in the Second World War. Uh, at the same time, uh, DL were uh, in, in Russia and V and O were in the Netherlands. Um, and D never liked the fact that the VOs were there, were included in the theory because he said he beat them to it. But he published in Russian, so I mean, that's, I, that's just tough luck, right? Okay, so what is this, the DL VO interaction? Uh, if one plots the force, uh, this would be the repulsive force divided by the radius because forces usually are scaled by the radius. Uh, that's what one expects as a function of distance. This shows a typical interaction that is the most common interaction in water between charged surfaces, positive or negative, where you get an electrostatic repulsion, which decays exponentially with a decay length that uh, depends on the Debye length, meaning it's longer ranged, the more dilute the solution. And at small distances, the van der Waal forces come in. So uh, if you have a dilute solution, you have um, a repulsion, and then eventually the van der Waal forces, were, and then you get uh, a tree, uh, attraction and adhesion in contact. That's theoretically. As you increase the electrolyte concentration, the repulsion comes in uh, closer in, and you can get what's known as a secondary minimum adhesion here, or an attraction here that wins out, and then the repulsion wins out, and then the attraction. And that's the interesting consequence of this theory, uh, that because you have one force that goes exponentially and one is a power law, you can get repulsion, attraction, repulsion, attraction, uh, or you can get, but usually it's attraction, repulsion, then attraction. And that's the basis of collo colloid science and biocolloidal systems. When systems adhere, are they adhering out here at a weak minimum or are they coming into contact? Um, so the first uh, experimental results I wanted to show which uh, uh, illustrate the, the important effects of time is what happens when you measure these forces, this is the repulsive force as a function of distance, at different rates. Now, two surfaces when they approach each other, the ions, uh, some ions will reabsorb on the surfaces or absorb on the surfaces and exchange with ions on the surfaces. This is known as charge regulation. You're forcing ions back on the surface that it takes time for ion exchange. Now, people usually think, oh, that only depends on the diffusion of ions in, in and out of the gap. No, it also depends on the exchange once the ions are on the surfaces. What I'm trying to show here is if one measures these forces as a function of, uh, of rate, even if one goes as slowly as uh, three nanometers a second, one totally overestimates the repulsion because the system is behaving more like what's known as a constant charge system. The, ch the surface charge hasn't had time to equilibrate with the ions absorbing on it, and when that happens, 
and yet you have to go less than 0.1 angstrom or 0.01 nanometer a second to get the equilibrium interaction where the ions have had time to equilibrate with the surfaces and reduce the surface charge to a lower uh, interaction. This is a simple example already of how interaction in an electrolyte, even at these rates, you are looking at a non-equilibrium interaction where the repulsion is stronger than expected on approach. By the way, usually on, on separation, it's, it looks more attractive than the equilibrium, but on coming together, it's more uh, repulsive. I'm going to give lots of examples of rate and time effects, and this one now is more biological. Two surfaces with proteins. Exposed to uh, uh, water, uh, the proteins will, um, well, exposed to uh, air, they will expose hydrophobic group, groups. Exposed to aqueous solution, they'll expose hydrophilic groups. Proteins change the conformation or configuration depending on the solution they're exposed to, or at least the groups exposed to the surface. Once they come into contact, however, if these are in water, once they come into contact, they could be hydrophobic groups that now rearrange to face each other because these no longer are exposed to water, and now the hydrophobic groups are happy to be exposed to other hydrophobic groups. But in addition, you can get interpenetration. So this is an example that happens with proteins and polymers in general, where with time, the contact uh, area changes, and uh, the, the whole contact changes. Molecular rearrangements occur, or group rearrangements occur. Hydrophobic groups point each, each other. Acidic and basic groups start pointing to each other. And with, and with time, you get also the interface uh, not remaining flat anymore. And so the adhesion in general increases with time, just keeping things in contact. And this, th these times can take milliseconds, or they can take minutes or hours. An example of this in a non-biological system is um, what happens when two surfaces, in this case um, a, polyst a polystyrene surface brought together with, uh, uh, against a mica surface and just left on the surface for a, a while, a long time, and uh, this polystyrene is not cross-linked. So what happens on separating is that, um, in this case, it's interesting that you see what's left behind on the mica is rings of polymer that have been transferred to that surface. And if you look at the other surface after separating, um, sorry, what's going on here? Uh, no, that's a, that's a polymer surface. If you look at the other surfaces, you see, on one surface you see ridges where polymer has been transferred. On the other one you see valleys exactly because that's where it's been transferred. But the most interesting thing is you notice that there are rings. And what happens is, this very often happens in adhesion, is surfaces do not separate gradually by having the area fall and then they come apart. They do it in a stick-slip fashion. And I'm going to talk about stick-slip later because that's very important for many, many processes. Things do not happen gradually or linearly or uniformly with rate. They happen often uh, with sudden jumps, and these are actually very important in understanding very pro uh, many properties of materials, both biological and non-biological materials. So here we have adhesion, but you look in detail, you see mat both material transfer and, uh, and uh, what's known as stick-slip motion. Now, with biological systems at the molecular level, we have lots of interactions uh, that can be time dependent. And the only two things I want to point out is, if you've got uh, the lifetime of a bond depends on the energy, uh, the expo uh, some characteristic rate, which is the vibration rate of the molecules uh, raised to e, the power of um, E over KT. So if you have a certain energy, like 10 kT, which is a typically strong hydro, uh, hydrogen bond, the lifetime could be uh, of that uh, bond could be a second or a minute or something like that, which isn't unusual. Uh, if it's uh, 1 kT, it'll be nanoseconds. 
But if you, it's 20 kT, so you, said you just have two bonds in contact, just twice the energy, or one bond of twice the energy, this goes to two weeks. So you see, you can double the energy of an interaction, but the lifetime of that binding can increase from orders of magnitude. And that's one thing I want to point out, that uh, the energy and the time scale very differently, or the number of bonds. One bond and two bonds, very different. The other thing is the, what I mentioned before, the sequential interactions where something happens here, and then it goes there, and then this moves to there. So uh, to think of it as just two things coming together is just part of, of a much bigger picture. There's diffusion, the, there's things happening in different parts of the system, so there's both in space and time a process. All these things are processes rather than something that can be just described as an interaction. Now, there is a theory known as the Bell theory that uh, um, I wanted to mention here because that actually showed uh, very clearly, uh, at least to biologists, I think something like this was well known to the physicists before that, but if you pull some molecule or if you break a bond or pull a molecule out when the, it's adhering, then, uh, and you think of the length of the molecule as the, the length of the bond, if you wish, uh, this is quite general. Well, you know, it's, it's the difference between the force needed to break a bond and the energy. And very often people assume that the two are, you know, if the energy is high, the force will be high. This isn't necessarily true. The energy is, can be a thermodynamic property and totally an equilibrium uh, uh, thing that doesn't change. But the force depends on all sorts of things, temperature, rate. If you've got a bond that uh, interaction potential that looks like that, which could be any sort of binding energy, the lifetime of that is, there's still a finite lifetime. If someone asks you how long should I weigh, uh, what force do I need to break this bond, uh, really what you should say is, well, how much time do you give me? Because if you say, well, if the person says, well, as long as you want, then the answer is zero. There's a life, finite lifetime to every bond. So if you've got as long as you want, the more, bigger the force you add, it adds, the force adds a term that makes the energy barrier lower and lower and lower, and hence the lifetime gets less and less and less. And uh, this is the equation by Bell where the force actually depends on the time and the temperature. So it's not as if the force is just the, the maximum gradient of the interaction potential with distance. It depends on temperature and the rate at which you are pulling things out. And and uh, Evans and Ritchie were uh, one of the first to use AFM uh, to show for a very common interaction, the avidin biotin which is a strong non-covalent ligand receptor interaction, that uh, what they did is change the pulling rate with AFM uh, rather than add different forces, but it's, it's a similar thing. And here's the force they got, and they found as, you know, changing by, this has to be a log plot usually to see the effect, uh, but changing it by orders of magnitude, you go from something that's hardly any force at all to the maximum force as expected. This shows uh, in some interesting consequences in general. If you've got two surfaces, say two biological membranes, and you've got proteins here, and you've got ligands here, and they're at the end of a tether, and you want to know the, this complex interaction, again, there is an interaction potential between this ligand and this a receptor, say, but the thing that's really important isn't so much that strength of that interaction or even the range of, uh, of it, it's how far these surfaces are from each other, how long they're there, uh, you know, how fast are they moving, because there's a finite, if this surface is moving that way or coming here and, uh, and going off again, faster than this can reach it because there's a statistic Statistically, this is very unlikely to extend this far if this is further than what's known as the contour length of this tether or polymer. If this is closer, then statistically there's a given time when this will reach that. The actual probability of capture depends on the dynamics of this system rather than the strength of that binding. And uh, so in general, if we're looking at biological systems that involve ligand receptor interactions at the molecular level, 
uh, if we bring two surfaces together and they may have ligands on tethers and proteins, if they come together quickly, uh, they may not, uh, they may be coming so quickly together that there's no time for these to actually get it, find the, the receptors. They get trapped, they get jammed. Uh, on the other hand, if they're brought together slowly and then kept at a certain distance, there's time for this uh, binding to occur. So the rate of approach is important to know whether binding occurs or not. Like on separation, a totally different thing can happen. It's possible that the, the bonds will break exactly where they formed, but as we know from many experiments, AFM including, other things can happen. On separation, one might break, pull out uh, the tether. Uh, one might pull out the protein, or one might denature the protein and make, make it unfold. So here's an example of, and each of these depends on the rates at which one separates. This could happen at one rate, but this would be the preferred um, deformations or, or, or preferred path at a different rate. These are really interesting uh, issues to do with the way that biological surfaces and uh, interact. I'm going to give some examples now where morpholo morphological changes are occurring with, um, with vesicles. Uh, so these are uh, biological membranes, uh, or, well, actually, these aren't. These are bilayers of lipids. Uh, now, lipid bilayers can form all sorts of strange structures. Vesicles are the most common ones. Uh, but when you look at them, especially if you shake them up, uh, they can do all sorts of strange things. Um, typically, what happens is that you start off, if they adhere to each other, uh, you start off with vesicles in solution, and after a while you start seeing that they adhere and they deform and flatten the way two so bubbles do. And, um, and, but after a much longer time, they will become what are known as liposomes. Uh, you get multilayers. Now, there are about four different processes, each with a different rate or each with a different activation energy to go from isolated vesicles uh, to the final state where you have multilamellar uh, liposomes. Both of these structures are commonly found in biological systems, in the cell. Uh, these are found uh, in the eyes and in other places, and um, or, in, or in the cell as well, like endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, there was a study, it was done in my group at some point, where we wanted to see what are these different processes. And what we found uh, without going again into great uh, quantitative details, is that we start off with a system of just separated vesicles and we end up after uh, three weeks with lots of liposomes. And we find that there are three process four processes going on. The first, which could be plotted in terms of the lowering of the adhesion of uh, energy or the total energy of the interaction with time. Uh, first, they just come together like spheres and adhere then the, and flatten, and that happens instantaneously, microseconds or less. Next, because they're flattened, the vol there's a pressure increase, uh, pressure there, so water starts diffusing out. And slowly the water diffuses out, it goes to a lower energy state, but that takes much longer. Meanwhile, the osmotic pressure increases as the water goes out, and then it stops. Then the ions diffuse out, they diffuse out much more slowly. And then you go here, and that takes much longer. And then finally, they rupture and fuse, and two vesicles fuse into one, and so on. And then is the next step. And so there's four or five processes going from the initial deformations to osmotic equilibration, to, to, to pressure equilibration, to osmotic equilibration, and then finally the final structures. Here's an example of four different rates uh, that involve morphological changes uh, with time. Now I'm going to continue and talk a little bit about uh, friction forces. and uh, I've spoken only about uh, adhesion forces so far, or things coming together and separating. In biological systems and in most other systems where we have uh, materials uh, involved, there's a lot of so, I mean, but most of our motion is actually surfaces sliding past each other rather than 
coming together and separating. And the same with many other uh, process, uh, uh, processes where invo involving, um, well, most things that involve any dynamics, things are moving laterally past each other at the same time as they're moving towards and away from each other. Now, we can do these friction experiments. Um, I'm going to talk about friction and lubrication, but also friction and adhesion. Friction and adhesion are intimately related, and yet the two fields are traditionally considered very separately. Uh, but there's lots of things uh, where the two are related, and something that someone thinks is friction is actually adhesion or the other way around. Uh, for example, if, uh, if a photograph on a wall uh, falls down, m most people say, oh, the adhesion has failed. But actually, it's the friction that is, you know, it's, you know, is it friction or is it adhesion? After all, it's sliding down past the surface. Shouldn't that be friction? So uh, we'll see the, uh, how the two come together. Now, to make these measurements is actually quite complicated. Bringing two surfaces together and separating them is pretty straightforward. You bring them together, give them rate, see how they deform, separate them, keep them for a certain time in contact, and so on. Friction, you have to know. Uh, how fast you are moving something, then it's connected to the surfaces through some compliant element. And then here, there's all sorts of complicated things going on. There's a load. There's the viscosity here, which is different from the bulk, usually, if it's a thin film. And there's the structure of this surface, structure of the... It's a much more complex process uh, altogether than, um, than, than just bringing surfaces together and separating them. Uh, plus, as you move, as it slides, there can be all sorts of interesting effects going on, uh, as I will uh, elaborate. And the first thing I want to say, just two important things about friction, is that uh, the slide concerning the sliding and time effects. The first one is that as the friction goes to zero, uh, the friction must go to zero as the velocity goes to zero. People often talk about a static yield point or inherent fracture strength. Uh, it's a bit like the pitch drop experiment I was showing. Well, actually, if you wait long enough, everything is eventually going to move, whether it's pitch or whether, whatever it is. So, the, so really, it, it's always velocity dependent. Uh, and the same for adhesion. If you pull for long enough uh, at a low, low, very low force, it'll still come off at a finite temperature at some point. Same with friction. So this idea, I'm sorry, but anyone who's a material scientist, everything in the books is wrong. There's no such thing as a, as a static, inherent yield strength or fracture strength or so on. It all depends on temperature and time. It does mean something if you do it quickly and suddenly and just pull and then measure it. But otherwise, you're going to get a very different answer if you pull at a slightly lower force and wait for a much longer time. So then the question is, what do you plot on your stress-strain curve? You, unless you specify the time and, and so on. Um, the other thing is that, um, so this is, what I'm, uh, this is an experiment that uh, we did some time ago. We go right down to, to velocities of, uh, this is 0.1 angstrom a second. Uh, and then you can see that over many orders of magnitude, the friction is, is dependent on the velocity. And very often, you see a maximum and then a minimum, a maximum, a minimum. And in the negative slope regime is when you solve the equations of motion, you find you have stick slip. And that's really interesting. Stick slip is a very common phenomenon. And very often, people ignore the importance of stick slip friction. Just like stick slip adhesion, I showed you when two surfaces separate with polymers, uh, depending if they're elastomers or if, if they're uh, cross-linked or not. But but there can be stick slip and material transfer and, and complications uh, like that. So stick slip happens until the, veloci the velocity, uh, the gradient in velocity goes up again. This behaves more like a liquid, you know. Friction goes up with velocity. This is now, uh, if you wish, uh, look, uh, looks a little bit like shear thinning. Frick stick slip can have uh, many different uh, uh, features. You can have very regular stick slip, and then above a certain velocity, it will disappear altogether. Or you can have stick slip, which just with increasing velocity, the amplitude goes down and the frequency goes up. Or you can have no stick slip at all, where the liquid uh, lubricant behaves like a viscous one, 
and then with time you just uh, as you reach the maximum thing it starts moving and uh, it moves at a higher force and this is just explained by Couette flow or Poiset flow. Uh, this is very interesting. This is what happens um, when you have a squeaking door. Uh, you will maybe subconsciously open it quickly uh, and then make the squeak go away. And that's because many stick slip effects disappear. The squeaking door means that it's stick slip, otherwise we wouldn't hear it. And the fact that we hear it means it's at about 5 to 10 kilohertz, uh, the stick slip that's causing it uh, to hear it. So the fact that you can hear something already tells you that there's stick slip there. Um, if you rub your fingers against your ear, uh, near your ears, you will hear something, and that means that the, the stick slip going on between your fingers at uh, hundreds to maybe a thousand uh, hertz. If you lick your fingers and then you won't hear anything, it means that the stick slip has gone away. And a lot of sensory perception is all to do with the perception of stick slip. Uh, so I'm just giving an example here, and here's some homework for you guys. Um, there's three violin uh, responses. Um, now, one of these is a Stradivarius violin. The other one is a very good Japanese violin. And the third one is, uh, I don't know, I think it's from Kmart. Um, <laughs> and for you to decide which of these is the Stradivarius, and which is the Kmart, and which is the uh, Japanese one. Stick slip is important in all sorts of areas. I wish I could talk uh, more. It's a squeaking door, diapers. Um, Velcro and you know how to avoid wakes up the babies when it rips and so on. I did some research on that once, how to <coughs> avoid w babies waking up when you pull the diapers away. Uh, food texture, um, <laughs> crashing computers, biological saltation motion, uh, wear damage cells. I'll give some ex examples of some of these. So anyway, we'll come back to that right at the end and we'll see how many, how many people know. Okay, so here's an, just one of many examples. Um, when you have leukocytes going along the uh, endothelial cells, uh, it's found that they go in a, in, in, in a salt, what's known as saltative motion, where um, those inside the, in, in the flow will be going at uh, 200 to 800 microns a second, but those near the surface go very slowly, and they go in a stick-slip fashion. They move, they stop, then they move again rapidly, then they stop, move rapidly, and stop. They're undergoing a type of stick-slip motion, even though uh, I'm not sure that theories of, sticks, of friction that are applied these days to stick-slip motion has ever been used to, to analyze this. But here's an example that is actually stick-slip. And uh, this goes back to data by Dan uh, Hammer. Um, Another example of stick slip, as I said, uh, is to do with sensory perception. Uh, food texture is an example. If one measures the um, friction uh, or as a function of velocity of different types of uh, mayonnaises or chocolates, uh, one will find that uh, in this case it's uh, fat free or light or full fat. Um, one finds that the tastier something is, usually it's because the friction has a negative slope and so the tongue against the palate or the teeth go in a stick slip fashion because of the negative slope and that's when the sensors pick up something. If there's no stick slip as you move the tongue or you don't feel anything because nothing is actually happening. Um, the sensory things aren't picking up any signal. They're not picking up a constant load that isn't changing. This is the thing that actually makes things, um, uh, makes the, most of the sensors pick up things. Um, I'll give an exam other examples. This is some work uh, that's been done by us and other people on um, cartilage, stick, slip, and wear of articular joints. Now, as I mentioned before, when you have stick slip, it depends on, wh on what regime of velocity you're in. At low velocities, there will be no stick slip. There will be slow creep. At very high velocities, it may go so fast that there's actually no time to stick slip. It's just slipping all the time. Somewhere in between, there could be one or two regimes of stick slip. And uh, we did some experiments where we investigated this. 
And we find, sure enough, there's some regimes as we slide back and forth. If there's no stick slip, that's the friction that one measures. You go one way and then the other way. In other cases, there's some very definite stick slip. And you can see that. Um, in some cases, you get what are known as some stiction spikes. You can, they can be quite complex behavior. But the main thing I wanted to say is that uh, we did these experiments and found that the damage that was done occurred in the regime where there was stick slip. So it didn't depend so much on the load or the friction coefficient. So long as the friction is, is uniform, the sliding is uniform, doesn't matter if the friction coefficient, which is defined as the friction force divided by the load, that can be high. But that doesn't cause damage. Well, it could, but not in many cases. What causes damage is this irregular, sudden, continuous jerky motion. And each time, it's as if it, you, you hit it with a small hammer. And you give it all these knocks. The knocks may only be half a micron. But at the level of the tissues and the cells and so on, or any material, half a micron is a lot. And that's why you can have something um, uh, stick slip, which you often is not is ignored in measurements. People just measure the average. But that's what often is the important uh, thing. And there are some theories of stick slip now, which uh, I, I won't go into either, but I'll just say there are theories. Uh, in, and this applies across all sorts of scales, too. So at, I've been talking about things at the molecular scale or, or micron scale. Now if we go to the other extreme of earthquakes, um, Here's some pictures of faults and so on. People like seeing pictures of earthquakes. Uh, I don't know why I put this one there. That's going in the wrong direction. But uh, anyway, so um, there are theories of that called rate and state theories. And there were different theories developed by tribologists. Tribologists are people who, who not who work on tribes, but who work on friction. And the tribologists develop theories of stick slip and the earthquake people so, uh, the, the crustologists, I don't know what they, <laughs> seismologists, crustologists, geologists. So anyway, <laughs> different theories. And uh, I got together with some uh, of the people who are working on uh, earthquakes. And they, um, and um, Carlson and uh, Luina, Archuleta and so on, and they develop, they, they have something where they analyze the power spectrum, which means you get a certain power spectrum, which gives you the intensity of the shock of the earthquake, uh, sorry, the intensity here as a frequency. As the frequency goes up, the intensity goes down, and it follows a certain power law. And this is telling you that it's chaotic, but not random. There's some mathematical uh, method of telling you if something is random. Because random may look random because it's all over the place, but you can do a certain mathematical analysis and say, no, it is actually deterministic. There is some method to the madness. It's not totally random, and that's a thought. And you get exactly the same thing when you're looking at friction at the molecular level. You get exactly the same law, uh, 1 over f squared power spectrum, uh, looking at friction traces where there is chaotic uh, uh, stick slip. So we see this going over enormous length scales. Um, I've started looking at some personal care products like creams, shampoos, hair conditioners, and all of that. Uh, I had to decide whether to do it for P&G or L'Oreal. Difficult if you have to decide whether you want to go to Paris or Cincinnati. Um, <laughs> <sighs> OK. So uh, here's some typical friction traces that uh, p most people might just measure it and say, oh, here's the average friction and so on. But actually, it turns out that there's a lot of information. And um, we developed something that allows us to measure over many, many orders of magnitude in velocity. Because you, know, you can feel things uh, uh, slowly or fast. and. Um, there's a lot of interesting features. So here, for example, is a friction trace. And you can see there's two types of stick slips superimposed, one at one frequency and one at another frequency. Then it turns out you can go to a 
totally different frequency regime, and then you get uh, sinusoidal things. And sinusoidal things usually mean it's not stick-slip anymore due to surface friction. It's a mechanical vibration of the system that's causing uh, you to stimulate one of the resonances of the system. And very often the two are confused. And so that's an uh, interesting thing, especially in, in, in motor cars and so on. When you get these vibrations, when you, you, when you engage the clutch or, um, oh, there are no more engaging of clutches anymore, is there, or brakes, oh no, brakes, okay. So if things shake, you know, is it stick slip or is it that you are triggering some resonance of the system due to the transmission system or the engine or the wheels or the springs and so on? Well. When one measures over many orders of magnitude of velocities, you can see, oh, in this regime it's that, in that regime it's something else. And all of these things are, well, interesting. So I'm going to finally talk about how geckos do what they do. Um, the geckos are known to climb on walls and ceilings. And, um, and for a long time people wanted to know how they do it. They want, people want to copy it to make adhesives that are reversible, uh, because a gecko can stick very strongly, whether it's to the wall or ceiling or many other, most other surfaces, and yet um, only for 10 milliseconds it brings its f feet down, and then, um, and then 10 milliseconds later it picks it up. So the question is, how do they do it, and then it, how does it do it? And why is it uh, uh, interesting is because to get something to stick strongly isn't that difficult. You can make a tape, and in fact I have some tape here I'm going to illustrate something with, and it can stick immediately. But to make it unstick without any energy or hardly any energy, and also as in, in 10 milliseconds, that was always something that's baffling. How do the geckos do it? Well. Um, this is really a detective story, a mystery. Uh, first of all, the shape of the gecko when it walks is, is giving away something. Uh, another thing is that all the fingers point radially out, unlike our fingers that all go in one direction. You know, if you slap someone, you do this, you don't do that. Um, also, the geckos are weird. Look the way they're bending their fingers, they're bending them the wrong way. So does that mean they're not very smart or that they are very smart? You can look at the structure of the gecko. By the way, this is not a dead gecko. Uh, <laughs> people ask me, what are you doing to your geckos to, make, to take a photograph? And I tell them, geckos don't like to be on the ground. The ground is dust. They cannot run fast. They can't grip on the ground when there's dust. And so um, they, you'll always find them on walls and ceilings. You will very rarely see them on the ground. Plus, they're afraid of prey, being preyed upon by land animals. So you'll see them on walls and ceilings. And so we have a cage, and they're on the wall or the ceiling. Uh, if it were like that, it would be dead. No, no, it would be. Uh, um, No, that's right. If it were dead, it would face the other way. This is a happy live gecko. <laughs> the dead gecko faces the other way. Yeah. OK. And then you look in detail. And first of all, you see the fingers radially out. You see things called seta. These are ridges. You look more carefully. Uh, oh, there's this thing sticking out. It's a bone. Why should it have a bone sticking out there? And it's like a nail, but it goes through the back of the, uh, of the toe. And then as you increase, you see more and more filaments and fibers called spatulae and so on. So what happens with geckos is, um, let me show a video also before explaining this. Now let's see, what am I doing? Oh, I don't want to do this. Or do I? Okay. Uh, so first I want to show how rapidly a gecko goes. Um, Oh no, this isn't coming across anymore. Oh no. Okay, sorry. I, I don't know. You remember what happened? I think I have to go back to here and display. I don't know. 
and then yes, then this, this go to this, this, and then close. Yeah, yes. And then open that. I'm sorry. Let's let's do the I, same. Oh. Then, then apply. There is a apply. Extend. Duplicate. duplicate apply. apply. Perfect. Ah. And can I close this now? Keep changes. Close this. Okay. So first we see a gecko how it moves. It moves very <laughs> rapidly. Actually, that slowed down. It moves much faster than that. However, this is, a, this is a genuinely slowed down version. And you see how it moves with the body making a funny motion? It's always got opposite hands. Oh, that string, you're wondering why that's there? It's because geckos can go on walls and ceilings. And if you didn't have a string, it's going up. And then it will go out of, that, um, <laughs> out of that thing. And you will never see it again. Uh, so you got to put geckos in there. Yeah, you got to you got to be smart. Um, so that's uh, that's the reason for the string. But they go very fast. So what uh, is the gecko doing? Um, let me illustrate. The gecko has got the fingers radiating out. If you wanted to pick up a beach ball and you put your fingers down and just lifted them up, you won't pick up the beach ball. What you do subconsciously maybe, you, you grip. You grip in and basically it's the friction that's high that allows you to pick up the beach ball. That's what the gecko does. It brings down its um, toes. There isn't much adhesion. Everyone thought, oh, the adhesion must be very high. The adhesion is, but it grips in. And now there's a very high friction, which when resolved this way, gets very high. OK, so how does it undo it? I'll show an example, and then I'll show a video. So first I'll show an example of what I'm talking about. <coughs> so imagine that the, this is a gecko. Um, bringing down its, um, well, first of all, here we have a gecko foot, or rather two opposite feet. So let's imagine the, uh, this is one foot, and there's the body, and there's the other foot, and uh, 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 yeah, see, so, so now. Um, <laughs> Don't like it? Uh, OK. Now, look at this. If I wanted to measure the adhesion, I can do it in two different ways. I can do this, and that doesn't require much force, actually. If I do it very fast, you get stick slip. Hmm. If I wanted to measure the friction, I have to pull it this way. And now I can put whatever force you want, and it just will not come off unless it will bring the whole building down. It's like Samson and, you know, the, the thing. It will bring the whole building down. And yet, when the two are separated, the same energy has been expended. The friction force is orders of magnitude higher than that even force. Now, this is what the gecko does. It brings down, that's the body, and it brings down one foot here and one foot here, and then it grips in. So now if you want to know the adhesion, you have to lift the body up, and it's very, very high. However, to undo, and I'll show it in a video, it just does that, and the, the energy and the force needed is very, very much less. Actually, I didn't realize how strong this, uh, uh, this thing is. I could have brought the house down. When, um, 
Oh, now it's sticking to me and I can't get rid of it. <laughs> okay, so um, anyway, um, and here's a video that, remember I said, look how it's bending its toes. It's going the wrong way. Nature, nature made a mistake or something. And yet, um, here we will see how it lifts it up in, ten, in less than 10 milliseconds. There. It's, it's peeling it off. And so it doesn't need much energy to undo. So it comes down, grips, and peels it off. So that's, let me tell you that many mechanical problems, um, many mechanical, uh, the geometry now becomes very important. You can see why, as material scientists, uh, it's really important to know the geometry of, um, of the system. Uh, it's not, you know, real systems do not just have do not just have two rods or a rod and you pull it apart. It depends whether you're peeling or sliding. I mean, I know in material science we have mode one fracture, mode two, mode three, but actually there's more different geometries. And the case of the gecko is a nice example of how it can make use of complex articulation to get very strong adhesion and friction. And the same happens in many other systems too. And that's the last slide I'm showing. Uh, muscles as well. Um, if you look in detail at the geometry, oop, who are these turkeys? Whatever they do. Uh, the muscle has a foot like that. And if you pull here, it's clear that the adhesion, in fact, if you pick this on, oh, I thought you could see what I'm doing. If you pick it up here with tweezers, It's very easy to peel it off. There's clearly not very strong adhesion. But because you're pulling it this way, the only way it can move is like with the gecko. It has to slip in here and slip there. And the slipping here has, has high friction. And that's what keeps it, uh, keeps it in place. So that brings me to the end of my talk. This is my group, the way it was at the time when this work was done. Many of those people have left me now. And now I'm reduced to just this miserable bunch. Um, <laughs> and th thank you very much. Oh, I forgot about the, oh, wait a minute. No, no, we can't work, okay. <laughs> Okay. No, no, this is the answer, but I wasn't going to show the answer. Okay, here's the answer. <laughs> the middle one is the, is, is the strad because it covers the biggest range of, um, of uh, frequencies, especially here and here, which is really what determines the power of a violin, whereas this one uh, falls, this one is miserable. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, but anyway, so there we are. I don't know, I should have uh, had that one up again. Uh, so I suppose you all pass <laughs> by, by default. Okay. All right. So um, you nicely uh, showed the, the geometry of, um, and role of geometry in the adhesion of Bisses thread in the yeah. last slide. Uh, but uh, how much that geometry is contributing and how much chemistry is actually kind of uh, playing role in, uh, in this kind of uh, complex uh, system when it comes to adhesion? Well, ultimately, the adhesion has to be at least, okay. If the adhesion is strong, which is chemistry, the friction will be very strong. But you don't need to have very strong adhesion to have this. The geometry can give you higher, 
friction and effective adhesion with a very low intrinsic adhesion force. And that's why, in a way, the system does that. Because to have high adhesion, you would usually need some covalent interactions. And they cannot be undone that easily. Whereas here, it can just use van der Waal forces, which occur between all surfaces, and still have this uh, happening. So yeah, I mean, if you had chemistry, you could have much higher. But then I'm not sure the system will um, be able to work quickly. And that gecko, you know, geckos will, will put their foot down, and that, that's it. They'll stay there for the rest of their lives. And they'll become extinct. My slides are not the, not the numbers, the, the times that I was going to reach when I, when I, um, there, slide 19. So you show the rupture force as a function of the rate. Yes. And the data seem to suggest there are two regimes. Yes. At the low rate, you know, the slope is relatively small, and then when you reach some critical rate, the, the force takes a much larger yes. slope. It suggests some kind of a crossover phenomena, some kind of a change in mechanism. Can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, yeah, people uh, analyze this. If you look at the avidin biotin uh, structure, uh, the receptor pocket, you see that the biotin can have a number of different conformations inside that pocket and that it can be pulled out a little bit, and then it has to rearrange in order to, for it to fully come out. And so you really have two processes involved there. It's not a simple bond the way I drew, I drew it. And, and I think I even write here, there are very subtle effects for multiple bonds in series or in parallel. And that's an example of it. If you've got a bond that, that you know, a tether may have two or three binding sites, and they either penetrate the surface or lie down on the surface, and you've got to pull the whole thing off. It gets very complicated. And when you've got other bonds nearby, it gets even more complicated, because this one has come off. And before you know it, this one, then this one comes off. But this one, meanwhile, has come back again. And so it's very difficult to interpret the results, except the general trend is always the same. The existence of this crossover yeah. suggests there's a competition between the two mechanisms. So right near the sort of the critical transition point, it would be very interesting to, uh, to uh, look into further details. But the competition is that favors one over the, the other. So the well, I suggest yeah. you write to uh, Evan Evans, who's a good friend of mine, and give him my regards. Um, I know they continued analyzing it. It could be that they use different type of Oh, no, wait a minute. They've got strept avidin and biotin and avidin. They're, they're, they're different systems. Yeah. But I also I know that the fact that it's not a simple curve or line is because of the complexity of the pocket of the receptor pocket in the avidin or strept avidin. So there are a number of complications there. You know, avidin is different. So, interestingly, these two things have one of the strongest non-covalent ligand receptor bond, uh, binding, and yet they're not found together in biological systems. They come, you know, one comes from eggs and the other one comes from I don't know where. Uh, so they don't meet each other biologically, yet they have the strongest affinity uh, for a 35 kT or whatever it is. Yeah. Just one quick question, Jacob. So you mentioned the word hierarchy when you were talking about the gecko attachment. And so you word what? Hierarchy. So you talked about hierarchical structural length scales oh, right. of, of yeah. sticking, right? Um, but has anyone yet been able to look at whether beneath the foot of the gecko there's also a temporal hierarchy? So sort of whether there's also different dynamics of bond sticking and coming off or whether the, the chemistry is all the same. So at the edge of the foot, are those bonds, those last bonds to stick, are they also the shortest lived? Or is there any sort of matching of time versus structure? Uh, 
I'm not aware of anyone that's done that. I think, as I said, there's 860 species of geckos. <laughs> some of them are very, very small. Some of them are, you know, pretty big. Um, certainly, it changes with the humidity. That's known. Um, but I think what you're asking is, do different geckos have different chemistries, or do they well, adjust their chemistry the same, to the environment? Yeah, or even under the same foot, like... Yeah. Whether okay, there's I'd... also different time scales. It looked like in the video you showed when they come off, yeah. it looked like at the edge there's some sort of oscillation of, oh, of, I see. of the very edge yeah. of the foot. Right. So I'm wondering whether the dynamics of that matter for the, for the friction. I'm sure the dynamics does matter, but I'm not aware of anyone that's actually studied. Oh, yeah. No, we've studied it. Wait a minute. <laughs> The faster you do it, the weaker the adhesion. And it also depends on the rate of coming down, how long you leave it down, and the rate of coming up. What we haven't studied, and I don't think anyone else has, is how the gecko optimizes it, so if you did it a bit faster or a bit slower, it wouldn't be as effective. That I don't know. And that would be an interesting thing to, to study. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I have a question regarding the sound analysis that you were doing for both the earthquakes and things like the violin on stick slip analysis. Has anybody applied that to microsystems like biofilms or um, the leukocytes that you mentioned earlier, kind of for the for analyzing dynamical systems in biological fields? You mean that power spectrum thing? I don't know um, if anyone's applied it to a biological system. The only systems I know are the earthquakes and biological measurements on surfaces, uh, non-biological surfaces. Um, it would be interesting to do. I think it's only recently that people have appreciated that in biological systems you have stick-slip friction and that it probably is very important because most measurements have always measured an average force. So, yeah, maybe you can do it. So it seemed to me that you can kind of broadly distinguish between friction and adhesion uh, based on the relative direction of movement. At least that's kind of the, the example that the laboratory example that you put together over there. But, uh, but then it's, uh, wasn't it a little bit uh, tricky in the sense that when you were pulling and uh, speaking about friction, it was because you, you have a huge area that you are trying to do all at once. So it's kind of the same with the dislocations. I mean, it's a mechanism that you, if you, if you could do it a little bit uh, at a time, then perhaps it wouldn't be that different one from the other. You're absolutely right. The thing with friction is you have to move every part of the surface at the same time. With adhesion, even you're peeling. And even if you think you are moving surfaces like that, you're not. You take an, a ceramic tie, well, it always starts at one end and starts peeling away. The only case where it, has to, where it is actually moving like that is if you have a very, very rigid ceramic tile and it cannot peel, and then you do have a very, very strong force needed to separate it. That's why ceramic tiles don't need a strong adhesive and they'll stay forever because the force needed to take it off is very high. But if you didn't have that backing material that cannot bend, it will come off just, just like that. So yes, you're absolutely right. It depends on how many molecules you're breaking in order to move the, you know, in one case, everything has to move at the same time. In the other case, it's the length of your tape. But the energy difference is the same at the end. But then in that case, one 
one could uh, conceive uh, a mechanism by which you, uh, you overcome friction one link at a time. But that's what the gecko did. They beat you to it. It's peeling, and therefore it's breaking one link at a time. But with, but with friction, not with peeling. Something no, like, no. Like no crawling. Friction. There's no friction. It's peeling away. It's like, it's, there's no fri uh, Well, let's put it this way. Friction is also the molecules have to be separated in order to go to the next lattice point. So you st it still involves adhesion to do that. In case of peeling, you, you still put the same energy in, but now it goes all the way off. With friction, you have to do all of these at the same time. With adhesion, you do that, and then the next one. But at each point, the force needed is just to break that. But it's the, the same mechanism in, 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 in both cases. It's just the area or the number of bonds you are breaking at any instant is, is very, very different. But they're both due to it. They're both due to adhesion, yeah. Ultimately. Well, let me thank the speaker again.